Welcome to the arts. I'm your host, Imano Hene. Many of you are likely familiar with the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which began in 2014 following Russia's annexation of Crimea. But the war's impact extends far beyond military action, which includes cyber attacks, a reflection of the war's digital dimension. Today, millions have been displaced and countless lives have been lost. Yet the stories of resilience and innovation emerge. Joining me today is Stepan, a Ukrainian AI researcher at Fordham University, who is now building his life and career in the United States of America. He has witnessed the cost of war and the profound impact it can have on individuals and communities. In this episode, we will explore his journey and the evolving role of AI from his perspective. Welcome, Stepan. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. We, we met in North Carolina and it's been a little over a year. And if I'm, if I'm asked to describe you, I would say um, you are smart, focused, and always on top of your game. But I want to know if you think that's a good description of you. Um, well, I would be a bit more humble about that. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm just trying to be somewhere. I'm trying to, to do my best. And if you see me that way, I'm, I'm just happy about that. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably how I, I would describe that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, would, I, would, I would like us to go back a little um, um, from back home. So how was it like um, growing up in Ukraine? Um, well, I don't have that much to complain about, to be honest, like I really, I really enjoyed my childhood. It wasn't like flawless, but probably barely no, ch no childhood is flawless, right? Um, all the way up to 2014, it was pretty, pretty calm and safe and everything like was, it never seemed like there can be any conflict or something like that. Um, so it was a bit shocking when that happened, but yeah, I guess for the most part, my childhood was pretty um, calm, safe, and it was just a general um, childhood of any kid uh, in Eastern European country uh, with, with its pros and its cons. And so, yeah. Right. So what, what was the, the most significant change after the war started? Um, I guess that was like the, the mentality and the, the switch in the head that, okay, in 21st century, in the middle of Europe, war is possible, is very, very possible. And like full scale war is possible. That was a bit like mind breaking. I'd say that was a bit unexpected to me because, um, throughout my entire like life and the childhood, the parents would tell me like there was a world war two and there was like the world war one and like it was disaster and then there were multiple like smaller walls in Afghanistan and, and everything like that um, and I was like okay I hope that that doesn't happen again um, and when it happened I was like okay that's that's pretty unexpected and in the middle of Europe there is a full-scale war happening like um, tanks uh, are riding all around the place and the, the aircrafts and like the helicopters are flying missiles are firing um, like that's very, very unusual. And for people from the even further West, um, than like than Ukraine, I guess it's even now is still so impossible, like so unexpected that it can happen that um, they barely fully understand, I guess, uh, what like, like the scale of what is happening. Right. And for, for someone who hasn't experienced war before, um, I cannot really put myself in your shoes. But I, I know um, it's been, it's been um, a tough time for a lot of Ukrainians, right? But if you wouldn't mind, can you share how the, the war ha um, influenced your decision to move to the United States? Um, I wouldn't say that exactly the war influenced my decision. So it was there like 
all the way before the war and it was there when the war started maybe by like i wasn't cautious like conscious enough to understand that it influenced um but like before the war i remember so so obviously like english is not my native language and i was taking some courses in english before um the war started uh and like the last class i remember before the the war at like it was late 2013s i guess or somewhere around like early 2014s um i remember like the me taking the class in english and we were discussing with my teacher that okay i i, I might want to go to the um like english speaking country to to get my higher education um it was not in the context of war at all it was just it was just there um and then later when i like the war started and everything happened and then i i had to like move from one place to a different place to to go like to continue my education and everything and so when i went to the for the higher education um my third year uh started with a semester in in spain so i spent one semester in studying in spain and so that was the first time when i experienced like other educational system like more western ed- educational system than what it is um back home because like they are very different like from my perspective they are super different sy- like educational systems and uh, in all the aspects basically um and so that was the first time when i experienced that and i had i've met some pretty like interesting and like smart professors there and they just some of them just recommended me that i should try to apply and like go to for the for the further education for my grad um education they recommended me to go to us and i was like okay that sounds like a, a good plan for me and so the first time i applied was actually back there in spain when the covid started that's where i started considering that and then that was the first time when i applied to um us education system when you finally decided um you wanted to uh move out like did you face any sort of challenges cause let me for myself um i moved here um in 2022 right and moving to the united states is, i would say is probably the biggest decision i've ever made right um having to leave behind family um and friends and sort of like i would say sort of like um starting everything from scratch all over right but for you what were some of the challenges you faced um when you decided to move to the united states oh i actually had a lot of small and big challenges like of different scale one of the ch- what the one that i most vividly remember like of course the parents living like my parents and my family and my friends that's a tough decision um but one of the hardest challenges that the challenges that i remember for myself is that when you're so i've been working back home i've been working for some for quite some time i've been pretty comfortable like in most cases like financial i could support my parents i could support um any well the the, the kind of life that i would enjoy i could support that and i could afford that uh and so this is like a a trap because this is a trap of um comfort zone and leaving that um i guess that that was a major that was a major challenge for me because like you have to leave um your job whatever is safe for you whatever you consider safe of course like i have i i had um a very strong push for myself of because of the war and it was like forcing me to do to leave everything behind but uh, leaving the comfort zone that's a major challenge i'd say and then of course um leaving my parents without the opportunity to see them frequently because that's that's very long term like project being here in US and i don't know when would be the next time i can see them and my my family my friends um everywhere like they're left all over the europe um some of them are still in ukraine some of them are not i don't know how and when i i will be able to see them so that's also a major challenge but in terms of leaving some what is what was definitely easy for me is leaving some um assets i mean some something physical physical assets like um personal belongings stuff uh flats everything like that so whatever my parents had um that was easy because that wasn't like 
throughout this war because it was lasting so long. It started in 2014 when we uh, had to move and we had to leave our house and everything. I just got used to traveling all the time. So I've, I'm just used to traveling and I'm used to not being at home. I'm used to live in the rent apartments. I'm so I'm com I'm pretty comfortable with that. I don't have any problems. So that I don't feel like that was a major major decision for me or that that was a major problem. Um, but I believe yeah, the comfort zone and leaving my parents and family that was difficult. Right. But did you have any expectations um, when you were moving to the United States? I wouldn't say that I have like had any any specific expectations. I would say that I just want I, I, I certainly was sort like I was sure that the life is not gonna be easy. The life is probably gonna be hard here and I will have to start everything from scratch and the culture is so different. Even though we are a bit exposed to the Western 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 culture there, um, we have uh, some T V series and we have internet and everything and we have YouTube. Um, but the culture is still, cult cultural shock is real. It's like happening with me, uh, at least happened. Uh, so I would say that I was, I was ready to some extent to see what's going to happen here, to see like what is the, what is happening in this country and what it's like to live here. And it surprised me a bit. So it was a bit more extreme than I, than I expected, even though I was pretty ready. I thought that I was ready. Um, but I didn't have any specific expectations like, okay, probably in, in a year and a half, I will be there or, or I will be here or I will be doing that or this. Um, I have some long term, long term plan, which is probably I'm, go, I'm like I'm planning to fulfill in the next prob like five, four years, um, but nothing too much specific, I'd say. Right. So I'm um, talking about cultural shocks and um, so. Um, you know, usually when when we, um, I'll I'll use myself as an example. Like traveling, we have our own goals that we want to achieve, right? So throughout the journey from Ukraine all the way to the United States, do you think the differences in culture and differences in environment has had any influence on your personal goals? Um, hmm. I would say that my personal goals are still unchanged. The only thing that I would say is probably I, I, I became a bit more ambitious because um, when you are raised in such an environment, you want to you want to strike more. You want to you want to achieve more just because you want to break out of this environment, because this environment is not very um, pleasant to be in. And if you are unsafe, um, that's, that's, if you are not unstable, then you are unsafe. And if you are unsafe, you are in a bad position because this is a basic, uh, Maslow pyramid, whatever is happening. Um, so yeah, probably that's why you want to, you want to strike better and you want to, you want to be on top and you want to be more ambitious in what you, what do you desire? Right. Right. So currently what are your hopes, um, for the future of, um, Ukraine? Um, I want to be, I want to be optimistic. I want to be like, if I, if I would be able to, I would like this conflict to end as soon as possible. Um, and I hope it will end as soon as possible. I hope that, um, people will stop dying. That's right. the first, like, that's the first problem that I want to solve. Like people are, are not dying and whatever is after that is after that. Um, that's, that's all like, we can figure that out. Uh, so I right. will just hope and I will really, really try hard to achieve that to, so that people are not dying and that the future of Ukraine is prosperous and happy, whatever the people of Ukraine wanted to be. Right, right. So um, you spoke previously about um, having to leave your job behind, um, your comfort and leaving your comfort zone. But I, I know you've worked for Volvo. Um, you've also worked for um, Distributed Labs. And you are currently um, doing uh, pursuing research at Fordham University, right? So, uh, how has your previous experiences shaped your decision to pursue research in in artificial intelligence? Um, so I wasn't uh, quite uh, like my my way of going to the uh, artificial intelligence research wasn't standard, I'd say. 
because most people would start with academia doing um, a lot of research and then they would just pursue that and they then they might switch to industry doing some research. Mm -hmm. um, I was a bit different because my undergrad was in software engineering. And so basically I am more of an engineer than a researcher, at least I was. Um, so I was more a, an applied person than a research person. Right. But all the time during, like during my undergrad, I was interested and I was um, fascinated by the AI and all of my side projects were in that domain. I was doing a lot of side projects, competition, hackathons, whatever happened, I, I was there. Like if, if there is a hackathon happening in my city, I was there. Um, and so that's how, like, that was my main passion. And we did some small, pretty, pretty interesting, but pretty small research, um, back home in, in the domain of AI. And that's when I felt like, okay, that's something interesting. That's something I would probably like to participate in. Right. And I just feel that I like solving these type of problems because usually when you are doing um, engineering, when you're doing something applied, you just sit and solve the problem. Um, you have, you probably have the solution or at least you know where to find the solution because engineers do not usually solve problems that has, have not been solved before. Yeah, they usually solve problems that have already been solved um, just in the most efficient and applicable way. Right. But researchers, they do solve problems that have never been solved before. And that was what fascinates me. There is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. There is just one type of problems and the other type of problems. And I just prefer probably thinking all the time about the problem. And when I'm in, at the shower, when I'm eating, taking breakfast, dinner, um, when I'm walking, I, I like thinking about the problem and trying to solve it in my head. And that's more of a researcher kind of mindset, I believe. That's right. that's how I ended up being a researcher, basically. Right. Yeah. Um I also I also did um um electrical engineering for my undergrad. And I remember those periods I was just like you mentioning um hackathons. I used to join um a lot of hackathons and there was this one that I joined and um, they have specific challenges, right? Uh, and you have to choose between um, blockchain or or using AI, right? And I was in a um, we were a group of um, I think four people, and we we decided to actually do both. And and that was when I think I really got interested in um, in AI and decided to pursue um, data science for graduate studies so um yeah but it's, it's it's really fascinating how sometimes the little things can influence like us to make bigger decisions throughout your career right um are there specific um breakthrough moments that you would like to highlight um most of my career uh was so the the first the biggest part of my of my path was in the domain of blockchain, just whatever you just mentioned. Um, and so there were, there were some pretty breakthrough moments when you just look at the, at the system and, and it's like running 2.5 millions of dollars and you build that system and you're like, okay, that's, that's probably interesting to happen. And like, it, it has tons of users and users are trading and it, it all happens uh, real time. A lot of transactions are happening and you brought the whole logic, how these transactions are working and you know, like what is, what is under the hood. And that's pretty fascinating. Um, and so, yeah, I believe that this, th that was one of the moments when I realized that on the re on the high, very big scale, a lot of people are using that and that's real money, like they're trading real money. Um, they are really doing that. Um, and also maybe one moment when you realize, uh, when you're doing some research, it's usually that you fail out of hundred time, you fail 99.9% .9 of the time. And when that 0.1% is successful, or at least looking successful to you, this is pretty mind blowing because you realize that most likely nobody has ever uh touched that it, it might be the case that you've just rediscovered some something but it's still fascinating because you rediscovered that yourself uh but if 
it is also pretty possible that nobody has ever discovered something and you just out of pure, I don't know, pure trial and, and fail and error, error type of approach, you just discovered something pretty interesting and, and fascinating. And that's, that's when you feel like this pretty pleasant uh, feeling that, that you are doing something meaningful. Right. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I recall back home before I moved here, I used to work with a bank as well. And whenever we launch, um, we move um, um, products to production and then um, literally all the branches in the country rely on the software. So like seeing the amount of data coming in, the reviews from, from the users, just it's, it's, it's quite um, fascinating. Yeah. But talking about AI, right, you recently published a paper and I would, I would want us to talk about it. Um, breaking free transformer models, right? And so what motivated you to um, explore task-specific attribution in transformer models? Um, so this is a collaborative work of me and my um, research advisor, uh, Professor Amin. So basically, we all have large language models today this is like a state of the art and this is very fascinating what they're capable of. Um, but they also have a very, very big and major drawback. We have no idea how they work. We know how to make them work, but we have no idea how they work. And we also have no idea how to control their behavior, right? We don't know, like, um, we can in somehow say that probably saying something offensive or biased or something that might harm somebody's feeling is bad but we have no control over the weights of the network to um, make it not say that those things. We can just a little bit tune it, but we are not certain that 100% that we will be able to disable something that is potentially harmful. And basically this is what we are trying to achieve with our paper. This is, this is only the first paper in the series of papers that we are planning to publish. Uh, and this is just an intermediate work. What, on what we are doing. Uh, but basically the idea is that we can build a framework which is external to the model, to the large language model. Um, it's like an external framework that is just doing this tuning part that is making sure that whatever you are doing uh, with large language model is not gonna be, is not gonna cause any problem. So you can like literally disable um, something that is harmful, that is offensive, that is biased. So you just eliminate this bias. Uh, and that's basically what is context attribution in a very simple terms. Uh, so we want to be able to explain what causes model to be biased or offensive or harmful. And when we figure out what does that, we want to be able to turn that off. That's basically how this framework is supposed to be working. And right now we show with this paper, we show that, okay, we can do that. We can identify what is biased with context attribution. Not only that, we can also perform better on some specific downstream task with that context attribution. So this is a win-win for us. We are explaining the model better. We understand how it works better. And we also improve the performance of the model. And further, we will work on how we can now turn this off and make it safer. So for instance, if somebody's um, daughter logs into YouTube, she will not, when she communicates with some large language model, because that's going to happen soon, um, probably they will integrate something like Copilot there, or at least they already have a Copilot in Microsoft. And not only Microsoft should be able to disable those weights, but as a person who is using that for the downstream task or, or a company that is outsourcing that large language model, they would be able to tune the model the way they wanted to without a lot of resources. And they, they would be able to disable what is wrong and turn on what is right. Basically, that's the high level overview of the paper. That's, that's quite interesting. So um, I think you've given a scenario with um, like a YouTube user, which, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense a lot of sense um but can you share um specific specific challenges that you faced um during the, the research and and probably how you you overcame them 
Um, well, yeah, research is usually a lot of a lot of challenges because we are stepping, as I told, in a in a in an untouched domain. So some of the works are already there for this topic, uh, but the the way we do that, the context attribution is not there. So basically, the works that are doing that are doing that a bit differently. Some of them are um, tuning the external model as based on the logics of the main model. Some are doing that based on the like Laura is working a bit similar to what we are doing. Um, so challenges are coming up with a completely novel solution that, however, is not just novel, but is working and is solving the problem. And so when you hypothesize this solution, when you create it like it on, on paper or on a whiteboard, and you write it down, um, you put all the mass for it and you see that the mass converges you have to implement it and really see that not only mass converges in theory, but it also works in practice. And a ton of times we've been just discussing that with uh, Professor Amin, we would discuss something and then we see, okay, the mass does not converge or the mass converges, but the practice doesn't work uh, or the implementation is incorrect and we have to re-implement it. And so this is basically just the, the, the work process. Um, this, is the, this is the main challenge. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not going to work. And that's, you, have, you just don't have to be discouraged by that. Right. So how, how did you, how did you test your, your, your models? Um, so we prefer doing that in cross data set way. So basically the whole idea is that if we train the model on the specific data set, and then we test it on this data set, that's unfair. Uh, well, it's kind of fair, but that's not really fair. Uh, if we if we promise that this model is good cross data set, if, the, if we promise that it provides better generalizability and it provides better um, general performance, we want it to be working cross domain, right? So for instance, let's say for this specific paper, we worked with the semantic analysis. So we, we analyzed the sentiment of the, uh, reviews of movies, which is one domain. It's pretty obvious how that domain works, right? We, we, can, we can build a model pretty easily that would with high quality classify those um, reviews to negative or positive uh, sentiment. And this, this, is, this is fairly simple problem that has been solved a lot. But what if I then say that the model that we've just built, let's try to reapply that for the hateful speech detection. Would it work? Probably it wouldn't because the domains are not that, they are somewhat in the same direction, but the data sets are completely different because hateful speeches is, is a lot different from um, negative movie reviews. And what we show is that, okay, we can train this model on negative and positive movie reviews and then test it on hateful speech and it will still perform well. Um, going back to war, right? Currently, there's a war between Israel and Hamas, right? And I would say the the United States is also on a brink of war with um, Iran. And there are countries like um, Sudan, uh, which which is also experiencing some form of conflict. Um, I would say Haiti and probably El Salvador are also having their own issues. But... Um, I want to know how do you envision AI contributing to conflict resolution or humanitarian efforts in regions that are experiencing war or any form of uh, civil unrest? Um, I would say that we should not put that much uh, <laughs> effect and we should not put that much pressure on AI because that's really not something because so far we don't even know how how ai works we know how to make it work again that's that's very different from what how how it works um and making it decide and who is gonna who's gonna go to war or who is not gonna go to war and why and uh, who is gonna survive and who is gonna die and that's that's pretty pretty big of a task i'd say this is pretty big humanitarian um, problem that needs to be solved by so far I, I 
believe that it needs to be solved by, by people. Uh, of course, I'm not including the, the super smart AI that might appear like third generation AI in, I don't know how many years, maybe never, uh, that would just answer to any existential problem that we have. Right. But so far, why, while AI is pretty bad at, at even like uh, high school math, I would say that probably it's not the right time for that to, to solve that problems of that scale. I happened to um, listen to um, an interview by Trevor Noah, and he was um, interviewing um, Altman, the CEO of um, OpenAI. And um, Altman's goal, according to that interview, is to reach AGI. And for, to the broader uh, audience, AGI is um, artificial general intelligence. So this is probably a, a trivial question, but um, what are the chances of AGI being the, the doom of mankind? So here's, here's my claim. Um, probably you haven't heard of any decent level model that would be able to consume and produce order, right? Mm -hmm. No. And as a human beings, we have a lot of senses. We have hearing, uh, vision, we have taste, we have odor, and we have like we have a lot of senses. Right. And so far, the only well, the only two I guess places where maybe three uh, places where uh, neural networks and a AI succeeds is well, the first one is text, right? Right. Which is not even something that is so obvious to how we perceive that because we perceive it with vision, but we can also perceive it with audio and how the brain processes that. That's not very trivial to me. Um, so basically text is the, is the key to everything else. And we also do, even when we do that with vision, we do text to image, image to text, uh, and so and so and so on. Right. So basically general artificial intelligence should be able to do all of that somehow, mm -hmm. which is pretty impossible at this stage. Um, I'm not saying that it's completely impossible. And of course, I understand why people like Sam Altman are claiming that they are going to do that because, well, they might be able to do that soon. But that's not something I, I really envision in the nearest future because I believe that uh, all the tools that are required for that are not yet there. Um, so basically, I believe that this requires a whole different approach. With right. current approach, we are very good at solving specific tasks. We are very, very good at it. And we'll, we will probably only um, improve that area. We will improve the uh, solutions of very, very specific tasks. And if you just take a look at what's happening in the state of the art currently with all the papers that are coming out, it's all about the same. It's all about um, using the transformer architecture to this and this and this data set and, and just add more data sets, um, add more data, add stack more layers, um, try something, try some new data pre-processing, but it's still the same attention transformers, which is an amazing architecture, which is a real breakthrough that happened um, in 2016, 2017s. Uh, but still, I believe this is not the, the architecture that is gonna bring AGI to us, right? And I believe that there needs to be the next step, and maybe not the the only one step. There might be required multiple steps um, taken before we move in the in the tool that would allow us to build the AGI. But I don't foresee that in the in the next ten years, I guess at least. Yeah, I think I think um, he made he made that clear as well. Um, it's not anything happening now, but basically that's his that's his goal and. I just wanted to pick your mind on that. Um, but I think um, uh, we, we will end here. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed this section. And I hope our, our listeners also enjoy this session. Um, thank you, Stepan. Thank you, you. Thank you for having me today.